in, in music, and then his love for astronomy, which is driving his interest in physics, is there in his recital poster, which has uh, space in it as a theme. And so um, I suppose in, we haven't looked at how this connects um, musically here in Black Hole Grove, um, but, but there are ways that we think about the LIGO um, talks earlier today. But um, Daniel worked with me on this project, which was um, definitely student-led. He said, I want to do something related to um, general relativity. So this, this really seminal and, and groundbreaking and changing uh, the way we think of how the universe works. And so I said, well, that's, you know, it's a big thing. <laughs> you know, we've got a big topic. What are we going to study? And we were very fortunate to have the LIGO group meeting on campus. And it made us um, just kind of zero in on this black hole growth. He's going to present two things. I won't, I won't give anything away. But he presents kind of two things, and I will say our conversations of going through, looking at um, research papers, finding out that no one had done a kind of survey that he's going to present here in original literature, that we were going to the original literature and putting that together, and then to combine that with his, um, his programming and his modeling component. Uh, makes this, I just, it's just a, a, a one that I, I think you should be very proud of. It's a very neat project. Let's welcome Daniel Smith. Hi there, so I'm Daniel, and this semester I studied black hole growth with Professor Superson. And the goal of my project here is, is to communicate really that black holes are not some malicious object as popular science might depict them. They're not just destroyers of worlds or cosmic vacuum cleaners, but they're in fact dynamic and very interesting objects that are integral to the structure of our universe. This illustration is from um, a German-based educational studio named, I practice this last name, Kurtz, Kurtz Gesagt which is German for in a nutshell or, or, or in short. And these are 10 minute videos on YouTube and they're um, really interesting and they cover topics all, of, all over science and astronomy. So in this presentation, um, I'll take a look at several different mechanisms of growth of black holes. I'll be referring to this quantity m dot, which is simply the change in mass of the black hole. And all these quantities will be in the same units. They'll be solar masses per million years for a Milky Way equivalent galaxy. The Milky Way equivalent galaxy simply means we're using numbers from our galaxy. So things like the number of stars in our galaxy or the number of black holes we have. The first problem we'll look at is the formation of black holes, how black holes are formed. The second is secular growth, which is simply matter falling into a black hole. The third is feeding from an accretion disk around the black hole. The mechanisms four and five are different because they're actually a loss of mass for black holes. That happens when black holes merge together to form one larger one. Or black holes also evaporate in a very slow process known as Hawking radiation. So first we'll take a look at how stars are made. So this is how stellar black and black holes are made. Stellar black holes are made when a star that's about 20 times the mass of our sun dies. And it explodes in a giant supernova, and then the core collapses into a black hole. This figure on the left here, if we look at the y-axis, this can be thought of the relative number of stars. And then the x-axis here is how heavy they are. And the part of this graph we're interested in is those that are about 20 times the mass of our sun and heavier. These are the stars that will collapse into black holes. And it's actually a relative fewer, fewer number of stars compared to the lighter mass ones. If you see this one here, this would be the mass of our sun. So by looking at literature, and we've made a, a, a rough estimate that about 7,000 solar masses of new black hole are created every million years in the Milky Way galaxy. This next section is the bulk and the primary contribution, my primary contribution to this project. Uh, I built, a, I coded a, a program in MATLAB that simulates masses falling into, into a black hole to better understand the secular growth rate. So these are two figures that, that I created early on in my coding. 
this one on the left here, there are 10 tracer particles that are falling towards the black hole that's shown by this blue dot here. And as you can see, these velocities and these masses are so incredibly high that as they fall towards the black hole, they're not captured, but instead they're flung out into space or flung out in different directions. And that um, contributes to my, to my point earlier that these black holes are not sucking in everything they come in contact with. In fact, they're, they're just another gravitational object that manipulates the world around. Um, I also encountered some errors in, in developing my code. If you take a look at the figure on the right here, the tracer particle starts here. This is the black hole singularity. And instead of falling into the black hole or being captured in a stable orbit, the orbit actually seems to increase, which is um, an alarm because it seems to violate the conservation of energy. The problem I discovered with this is that the time step in my simulation was too large. The time step can be thought of as simply each point at which the computer calculates the velocity of these particles. So if I'm only calculating the velocity of these particles every second or so, the accuracy is much less than it would be if I was calculating it as close to instantaneously as possible. So for, for an accurate enough simulation, with the computing power I had, which is simply my, my MacBook, um, the time step needed to be about uh, one millisecond or about a thousand times per second. So here's a successful capture of, from the final version of my program on the left here. The particle starts in the upper right corner and it falls towards the black hole and it's eventually captured by the black hole here. The, the black dot in the center is a singularity of the black hole. And then this ring around it is the event horizon, the Schwarzschild radius. This, this, the event horizon can be thought of simply as the area or the point of no return. Anything that falls within this region, even photons of light, will never be able to escape the, the, the grasp of the black hole. So when, when the computer detects that the particle is falling within inside this radius, it terminates. And um, sentient as it is, it tells me that it will. <laughs> so here's some examples of my code here. Um, I have a place to put an initial condition, so there, there is an initial velocity here. I have um, this if condition tells me if it's, if it's falling within the black hole radius, and then this other condition tells me if it hasn't. But something else I implemented into my code is the effects of GR, and specifically the temporal effects of general relativity. So that's what I'll take a look at now. So. You're going to have to tr trace yeah, it with the laser, sorry. Yeah. Okay. So here's the equation that defines the temporal effects of general relativity. This tau right here you can think of as the clock as it falls into a black hole, and then this T would be the clock of a very distant observer that's not within the, um, the gravitational field of the black hole at all. This is the radius of the event horizon, and this is how close it is to the black hole. As the particle falls towards the black hole, this number becomes smaller and smaller, and it's multiplied by the distant observer's clock. So as it comes closer to the black hole, we see that the the observer falling into the black hole is actually experiencing less time than the observer as it falls in. And I'll trace this graph for you here. On the y-axis, this is the amount of time experienced by the particle. And on the x-axis is the distant observer's clock. So there's an identity function here which is simply the observer's clock. The observer experiences their own time, obviously. But where this asymptote is here, this is the clock that fell into the black hole. So as it's falling towards the black hole, due to the effects of time dilation, their clock is actually ticking slower. Another way to think about this is if you were to fall into a black hole and look out into the universe, you would actually see the universe in fast forward, as if someone had pushed fast forward on a VHS tape. If you were able to float above the event horizon and look out into space, it would, it would be quite, quite a thing to do. 
Um, so the results of my simulation, they, they showed that it's actually difficult for, for matter to be captured by a black hole. Often it's captured in a stable <coughs> orbit as part of the accretion disk in a black hole, or it's just flung away into open space. Um, there's also the effects of X-ray emission from black holes, which push away masses before they can even get close to the black hole. To estimate the secular growth rate, we take a take a cross-sectional area multiplied by the density of matter within space and the velocity that it moves at. And we estimated that to be about a tenth of a solar mass per million years is the estimated growth rate of just things that fall into a black hole. So next we'll look at feeding from the accretion disk and for this example we took at the we took a look at the supermassive black hole that's in the center of the Milky Way galaxy next to Sagittarius A. The the mass of that black hole is roughly about uh, four million solar masses. And to make a rough estimate, if we divide that by the time of the universe, it's about it's about 300 solar masses per million years for the accretion rate of the supermassive black hole. It would be far less for um, a typical black hole in our galaxy. So here's that number here again. And now we'll take a look at the mechanisms which actually reduce the mass of a black hole. And one of those is merger events. And this is the, the field of LIGO where there's um, great strides happening right now. So this graph shows three different scenarios. Uh, this table. First is a neutron-neutron star collision which forms a black hole, a neutron star black hole collision which forms a black hole, and a black hole black hole collision. And these merger events are extremely interesting because the, the black hole that results from each of these events has a mass that's actually less than the sum of the two that went in. And that's because when they collide they release these gravitational waves and that's releasing a, a ton of energy. So the resulting object actually has less mass than the two that went into it. We can see here that when two black holes merge, there's about a three, three solar mass loss per event. And if we take into account the merger rate, which is about two black hole mergers in our galaxy every one million years, there's a loss of about 1.2 solar masses per million years due to mergers for black hole black hole mergers. And the last mechanism that we'll take a look at is evaporation. The evaporation of a black hole happens through a process known as Hawking radiation, which is um, very abstracting. So Hawking radiation can be thought of as what we think of as a what we think of as a vacuum is not actually a vacuum. That there's in fact it's bubbling with activity and particles and antiparticles popping in and out of existence. So typically, there would be um, a particle and an antiparticle, and they would immediately annihilate each other, and this satisfies the conservation of energy. But if these particles are created exactly on the event horizon of a black hole, there's the possibility that one of them will be lost into space, and the other will be captured by the black hole. And this results in a loss of mass from the black hole. Now, this process is extremely slow. It's so extremely slow that, by our calculation, we've estimated about a loss of 1.5 times 10 to the negative 55 solar masses per million years, which is so incredibly slow that, that black holes will actually be some of the last dynamic objects in our universe after all the, all the ground works and everything die out. These black holes will be the last thing to die in February away. So just a, a quick review here. Here's a comparison of all the mechanisms that I just looked at, and I hope this gives you some greater insight onto, onto how black holes behave, and they're not just vacuum cleaners of the cosmos, but they're actually these extremely interesting objects with, with a bunch of different things that we can study. So I want to take this opportunity to thank Dr. Sieberson again for this awesome project, and also um, Professor Target and Professor Kaminsky for their help in this. Uh, I had a lot of fun, and the LIGO conference, having the LIGO conference here on campus was extremely awesome. I got to talk to a lot of the researchers that came here about my project, and, and that contributed greatly.